we're going to talk about spiritual warfare, worship, mental illness, and Christians. And I feel like those flow pretty well together. Mm-hmm. I think. Do you want to start with worship since that's kind of where we left off? Let's start with worship. Yeah. Let's do that. Let's, uh, what, what is worship to you? I, I've got the definition of worship, right? Mm-hmm. Which I think is important. Uh, let's see. So worship to me is, I, I'm into some different fantasy stuff. Okay. Like, you know, kings, old timey type stuff. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah that yeah. kind of fantasy stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And so in that, my mind goes a lot of times to how they talk about the people at the top. The kings and the lords of the land and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So for me, worship in my mind, I love jumping to that and thinking Jesus is king. And I know it's a phrase that's used all the time. It's a phrase that's everywhere. But back in the day or whatever, when there was a king, people worshipped him. You had to. Yeah. I mean, even now, right? Even now, um, yeah. North Korea, stuff like that. Yeah. It still goes on. Yeah. But Jesus, God the Father, is literally our king that we choose to worship. Yeah. I talked about this a little last time, the throne, how I'm at his feet. But I love that. That's my vision of worship. My vision of worship is holding him up Yeah. from our perspective. Yep. We can't ever actually hold God up higher than he is. But from our perspective, it's holding him to the place we think of him at. Yeah. So it's humbling ourselves, holding him up, worshiping his name. Last week you said something that I think we need to like camp on for a little bit. Mm-hmm. You said, I get small. Yeah. And we talked about this just a little bit, I think Sunday or something like that. Yeah. But can you expound on I get small? Well, as a bigger guy, <laughs> physically. What are I, you, 6'3"? Yeah, 6'3", you know, big dude. That's a good guess. Yeah, that's a good guess. Um, but getting small for me, it is kind of physical. I literally feel like I get small. And so for me, it's almost like a... The switch that I flip. Because yeah. when I'm walking around grocery stores or something, I'm usually the tallest person. Yeah. It's just usually how it is. I feel you. Not at family gatherings. Family gatherings, I'm usually the shortest person, which is <laughs> weird. That's another conversation. Yeah. But in your grocery store, you're the biggest person. And uh, I was talking about this with my wife, how, um, like she was talking about, she works at in fast food, and she had somebody come in the restaurant. And they came in the restaurant yelling, yelling cuss words. They were mad because somebody couldn't hear them on the speaker. It was as simple as that. Couldn't hear them talk. But this person came in the restaurant yelling, and I asked, I was like, well, what would you do? She said, luckily, Derek was there. Derek is a guy who's a little bigger and um, somebody who's just, you would call intimidating, yeah. more so. Yep. And it kind of hit me, and what if it had just been her? I don't think about that. Yeah. When I worked in places like that, I was the big person. Yeah. I was the intimidating face, the person who, if somebody came into the store angry or something, I, what are they going to do? Yeah. You know? Yep. And then thinking about that, I have to put myself in that situation. Yeah. There's nothing I can do to God. It's literally making myself the smallest possible thing I could think of in the moment. Yeah. And making myself something that I don't I don't affect the situation. All I can do is worship and praise. So that's what it means to me. Yeah. And so that's kind of the physical difference that I'm talking about. The fact that you're not really a presence. Yeah. You're doing this because he's the presence. Yeah. Yeah. When you say I get small, I hear that, but I also hear I get low. That's how I've often heard it translated is I get low. Yeah. Like, and in the, the verbiage is different, but the meaning is the same, right? right? I get small, I get low, like not like self battery where you're like, who right. is me? Not not like that. Yeah, but like getting to a place of accepting who he is and what he came for. And when you get low, you realize, or when you get small, you realize exactly what he came to do, mm. and what he came to do for us. I can't save myself. Mm. You know. Yeah, that's big. Like I, I can't, I can't make my mind new. As hard as we try, and as many as great programs as there is out there, when I say I can't make my mind new, I'm talking about new back to Adam and Eve, back to our original created value, what the mind is supposed to be like. Not not a mind that is constantly judging good and evil, but a mind that just constantly loves. Mm. I think that's the created value of your mind. Your, your created purpose is just to love. Mm. And so I can't do that. 
unless I get small, unless I get low. And living in that place is, I think, a great place of worship. Absolutely. Even for people that that can't sing songs or play instruments or do the creative things. You know, I think sometimes we get caught up in worship is an art. I was just about to say, you said, um, you said something along the lines of a place of worship. I think that's huge. Worship isn't always a thing we give. Yeah. Worship is a place we get to. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And I think all, even especially throughout our day and things, throughout just living our life. Yeah. But that was big. Yeah, I like that. We talk about, uh, last week we talked about a guy who, his wife passed away, and the first thing he did mm. was he worshiped. Yeah. He gave sacrifice. In that moment, the last thing anybody wants to do, even him, I guarantee the last thing you want to do is to worship. Yeah. But the first thing we always need to do is worship, right? Like give that sacrifice, which, so if I was to boil worship down, I asked you what your definition was. Yeah, yeah. We took a long way around to get to mine. <laughs> but um, I think my definition is simply sacrifice. When you come in on a Sunday morning, you're sacrificing your time. Mm. When you come in on a Wednesday night, you're sacrificing your time. Can you remember when you very first raised your hands? Mm, yeah. Or charismatic, and we like to do the thing. For me, it was much later, raised in a Baptist church, but yes, Same. I can remember. Me too. I, I went to a charismatic church for years, yeah. and I would watch everybody around me raise their hands. And as weird as it is, and I don't, I, that's not a huge sacrifice. That's not what I'm saying. No, no, I guess you're But the saying. first time right. when you sacrifice that bit of pride, that bit of uh, embarrassment, yeah. I guess, that is a small piece of sacrifice. But outside of that, um, worship to me, I think, is sacrifice. And so... I like that because it's my opinion, <laughs> but also because it doesn't box worship into this box of between from 10 a.m. Mm. till what, 1045? Yeah. Sometimes 11. Yeah. We're going to sing songs and we're going to worship. It opens up the box of worship to where now as I'm walking on the sidewalk and I see a piece of trash, I pick that up. And, you know, I know that sounds cliche and like... That's not really worship. But if you think about what that does, mm -hmm. one, keeps his creation clean. Right. Two, you sacrifice your time and you sacrifice the humility to listen to the Holy Spirit tell you, hey, pick that up. And so that becomes an act of worship. Yeah. Simple as that is, but I think that is a beautiful picture to break outside of the yeah. box of worship is an art form. Yeah, I think so. Absolutely. Worship as an art form is so beautiful and mm -hmm. so precious. I think one way, because like you're saying, it's so many different things. And I think some of my favorite worship I've ever experienced in an art form sense or seeing mm -hmm. somebody do something is when I've been on mission trips yeah, in different countries. And because I've led worship in different countries, and they have no clue what I'm saying, and they're just worshiping. It's not about the words. Yeah. It's just about they're just making noises to God. Yeah. And trying to sing what I'm singing and that kind of thing. Yeah. So I love it. What about, um, I assume in these countries, these did they have transportation or was it mainly walking? It was mainly walking. It was mainly villages. It was in Nicaragua. So maybe there isn't, but I, I want to, like, I feel like we've got two parallel things going on here. Worship as a lifestyle, worship through the arts. Yeah. Through, through arts. And I feel like there's a marriage. So what if worship started when they took their first step? No music, no song, but the worship started like, God, I'm getting ready to walk, what do you think, 10 miles? Yeah, maybe. Maybe? Yeah. Even five. Yeah. Who walks five miles these days? Yeah. Not a lot of people. Um, but these people wake up and decide to walk, not only to worship in art and to worship through music and song, but they worshiped as they walked, Yeah. whether they were singing or not. Yeah. I, I can't yeah. stress enough, like... The sounds of heaven maybe is just a footstep. Mm. You know what I mean? What yeah. if the sound of heaven is just uh, the panting of your breath from walking five miles in sacrifice? There's no telling what they risked to walk during that miles, Very those true. miles, you know, which us in the States, we don't 
It's different. Yeah. What are we risking? Right. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So I think it's vital for us to press into the Holy Spirit and get a deep revelation on worship. It's what we're going to be doing forever anyways. Yeah, true. Forever. Yeah. yeah. It's so true, though. It's just the moments, the moments that they give up, the time they give up where they could be doing whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Fighting for their life in a lot of situations where like you're saying for us is so different. But Yeah. Mm. I think that's a, a, a good segue to, to maybe talk about so fighting for their life. I do see in the Western culture, you know, you hear people, you ask about testimonies, right? Like, How'd you come to the Lord? Well, you know, I hit rock bottom and, and I found Jesus there. And that's like kind of standard throughout. You almost expect it. Yeah. <laughs> like, you expect people to hit rock bottom, find Jesus there, and then and it's real interesting to me that at rock bottom is where a lot of people find Jesus, mm-hmm. and they don't find him before, because you know he's there. Right. He's constantly beckoning, hey, mm. I'm here. I'm here. As a gentleman, because he's never going to just snatch. Right. But he is there. Um. I think it's interesting to the rock bottom and fighting for your life. What fighting for your life and rock bottom does to somebody's spiritual eyes almost opens them. Well, it's when you're, it's your only option, right? <laughs> and that's what does it. Yeah. You get down and you can't move. Yeah. You can't, you can't pull yourself out. You, you can't walk out. That's yeah. what rock bottom is, right? The only thing you can do is look up. Get small. Get small and look up. Yeah. He's my yeah. only option. Yeah. It's only him. He's my only option. And that's easy. I hate to say easy because I don't ever want to minimalize or diminish somebody's rock bottom. That's a tough place. Absolutely. But on the mountaintop to say he's the only way for me. Hmm. Like he's the only way. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, for sure. It's fun to me. Like, and it, I, yeah, to get into spiritual warfare, right? Like, yeah. I don't know. You ever think about, you said Beckon earlier. Yeah. And I've I actually been thinking about that word this past week and how I think it's crazy that a lot of times when you look in nature, you're like, oh, wow, that's beautiful, all that stuff. But the way he painted nature beckons attention. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I, I think that is, I just love that. Me too. I just love that. I made can, me think of it when you said beckon. I went to a conference one time and. Y'all know what conferences do, right? You <laughs> oh, yeah. get all pumped up, oh, yeah. and then bam. Put you on fire. Yeah, yeah. Um, but this conference actually changed my life, shaped who I was as a person. And it wasn't the conference, right? right. It was the message of I'm his son. Mm-hmm. Like, he paid a price for me. Not because he had to, but because he wanted to, and he saw that there was value. Like, the price he paid, he valued me that much. Yeah. Um, so that's what the whole conference was about. And, uh, anyways, for like weeks, actually probably maybe years after this conference, I had been to this conference, there would be times the Holy Spirit would tell me like, Hey, just touch the grass. Hmm. And this is crazy, right? Yeah. yeah. But like, I'm not like that. Like I'm not the, you're not a grounded guy. No. Yes, I am. <laughs> uh, I love grounding. I think it's... Anyway, <laughs> talk about that. Like, I'm not like... Anyways. You, you know what you would call a hippie? Yeah. That's what you're saying. Yes, thank yeah, yeah. you. Anyways, I would touch the grass, and I would get this deep revelation that he spoke what I'm touching into existence. Mm. Like, you look at a tree, he spoke it into existence. It didn't just... Come to be like I know there's science and stuff behind how trees grow and yeah. grass grows and yeah, stuff yeah. like that, um, but at at its basic basic essence, he like I'm touching his word. You know what I mean? Yeah. And uh, yeah, I don't know why I was saying that, but no, it's beautiful. It's because we're talking about God's beauty, right? Yeah, nature. That's right. Yeah, yeah. and how it beckons you. Yeah, yeah. And like so, in those moments when I would touch the grass, it's like, how long does it take you to bend over and touch the grass? It mm-hmm. literally was that long, and in that moment, like it lit a fire, and it you know it makes your heart feel when you get those flutters. And I'm not a huge feeling guy. Like I like the feelings, but I know he's all around. I know the space that looks empty between you and me. 
he's filling the space, you know, like he's here, he's right. present. I know all of that. But to get those flutters, you know, when you have those God moments, it's... It's awesome. Oh, and it's nature beckoning. Yeah. Yeah. Love that. Yeah. Spiritual warfare. <laughs> all right, let's get into it. You want to? Yeah. You feel good about worship? I feel good about worship. How about you? Yeah. I uh, No. Let's okay. hang out for just a second. Yeah, let's hang, hang out, out for a second. I have another thought about what we've seen in church culture, how popular worship is. You know, we know the names that mm-hmm. have popped up in recent history, I'm saying the last five, ten years, and we've seen what worship has become and what it's done in the church, and I love it, mm-hmm. right? Like, I love the moments, yep. and I love, and I'm referring to worship by music right now. I love that. But I think as that culture was molded and shaped and churches around the country looked to what was happening and how that was being transformed and molded, and they in churches around the country molded their services to kind of mirror the few that were popular, Mm -hmm. it's made that a centerpiece, which has diminished worship as a lifestyle Mm. and so we've found that to be the only way yeah you know what i mean yeah and in a sense i say diminished but it changes focus yeah and he has so much when things like this happen for me i feel like the holy spirit shows me like this is what's happening but this is the this is the way that i wanted it to happen so it's not a bad thing Mm. but there's so much more yeah like the moments where we feel, you know, we, we begin to sing Yeshua over and over and over and over again, and we're all in the moment just focused on the altar, mm. on his presence. Our eyes are shifted into the heavenlies, and we feel his presence. Yeah. If the only way we can feel and obtain that um, consciousness yeah. is through song, then we've been cheated. Because he's here now. He's here then. He's here on a Thursday afternoon when everything's going wrong. That same presence is available then. Mm, yeah. With Out of all the production and outside of all the music and outside of all of that, like he wants to partner and give you those feelings and his presence just as much on a Thursday afternoon as he does on a Sunday morning. Right. What do you think? I think you're right. I do. Um, why, why do you think, why do you think it's easier to worship in, why is it easier in that moment when we're singing Yeshua over and over? It's the focus. I think so. Hmm. You know, on a Thursday, well, just go to Thursdays cause whatever on a Thursday afternoon, typically if you're a working citizen, you're going to be at your job right? or you're going to be caring for. Your family, you know, I think about stay-at-home moms or single moms or whatever. You know, there's there's begging for your attention on a Thursday afternoon. Sunday and Wednesday, Mm -hmm. you've set aside that time to worship. Yeah. And so that the stage is cleared, and the only thing that you can give your attention to or should give your attention to is Him. Yeah. But if you can master the, the, the art of getting low, master the art of heeding to the beckoning of his voice on a Thursday afternoon, those Sunday and Wednesday moments become almost part of your routine. Well, in a good way. Yeah. You live, you live in that presence. Like, and so when somebody says, man, I really felt the presence of God super strong today. Did you feel that? If super strong is your normal. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. And I don't have scripture Verses to back what I'm saying up. I just have experience, like yeah. experience in his presence and experience walking out the Thursday afternoon feeling his presence heavy. I, I can remember riding around in dump trucks at my previous job, and the presence of God would be in there. I think about one one moment in particular. <laughs> I was in a backhoe digging up, I think it was a curb or something. We were doing concrete work. Anyways, that's besides yeah, yeah. the back. I was in a backhoe. And so I would load up the material in the dump truck. And while that was gone, I would just sit there and meditate with the Holy Spirit. And uh, I think I might have had a sermon playing or something. 
it's kind of besides the fact it doesn't matter. The presence of God filled that backhoe so much that I began to weep. Mm. And this is like on a busy highway. Yeah. Of course, I'm protected by cones and stuff, but... I begin, my eyes are full of tears and I'm like, God, you have got to stop because I've got a dump truck coming up and I have to do my job. But it just, oh, his presence overwhelmed me. And this is like a, whatever, Monday, Tuesday, what, what time it was. My stick point Thursday is, afternoon. This yeah, it was a Thursday <laughs> afternoon. My point is like, his presence was just as strong, if not stronger in that backhoe yeah. than on a, any Sunday or Wednesday service that I've ever sat through. Yeah. And so, yeah, I paid such a price, man. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. he paid such a price more than just Sundays and Wednesdays. He paid the price to change our lives. Make it new. Yeah. Make it new. I heard, I heard somebody the other day, they said something along the lines of, he didn't come to, my apologies, bear with me though. No, I'm with you. It, they said, he didn't come to change your life, he came to make it new. Mm. Because in the changing, right, you still have artifacts of the old. Yeah, yeah. But in making new, like the old is completely gone, and this is you get me fired up. Hey. On a Tuesday evening, <laughs> that's what we want, right? Yeah, I feel like I'm talking a lot, and I want to give you a chance to interject on. Well, uh, yeah, yes, but you also you're, you're th- throwing your heart out over this topic of worship. Yeah, that's where it's at. Yeah, stick there. Yeah, I, I, I just know like. The bride of Christ, right, is, and I'm talked about this last week. I'm naturally what pessimistic, I guess. Yeah, right? said, but yeah. you wouldn't know that. Yeah, and I'm naturally like a critic, but I feel like it's out of a heart of that we obtain everything that He paid for. You know, mm-hmm. like, explain that a little more. So Thursdays. You know, he he paid the price to make me new every single moment of every single day. Right. And he paid the price where I don't have to walk with burdens. I don't have to mm-hmm. walk with this heaviness on my head and on my heart and on my mind. And I don't have to be worried about this. And I don't have to be worried about that. He paid the price that I be brand new and that I have no ailments, that I have no sickness, that I have no depression, anxiety. Like, he, that's the price he paid. Right. He didn't you know, like a he didn't get a deal. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. This wasn't a ten percent off deal where you know if you pay this price then you get this product, but if you pay this price then you get this one. Right? No, he paid one price to make us all brand new. And so many times I think that we let life experience cheat us out of what he paid for. Right. And what I mean by that is, well, Josh, that all sounds good that he makes you brand new, but you know I still deal with anxiety. Mm-hmm. That's life experience. Life experience is saying my anxiety is more real and more true than than the word, which is tough. Yeah. But the truth is the truth. And the truth is that he did set you free. The truth is 2,000 years ago, he wiped anxiety out completely. Yeah. He rendered Satan powerless. Now, I don't know why we still see effects of anxiety, depression. Because um, he's the prince of the power of the air, right? Yeah, but I still think the truth says, uh, it's actually Hebrews 2.14, check this out. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself, Jesus, likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil. So he destroyed the one who has the power of death. I think in a few other uh, translations, this is where it says, he has rendered Satan powerless. Hmm. And so, but we let... And understandably, right. understandably, we let life experience speak louder than this verse. Mm-hmm. But this is the truth. This The truth is that on Saturday, between Friday when he hung on the cross and Sunday when he raised from the dead, Saturday he wasn't just laying around doing nothing, you know? Yeah. He went to hell and took the keys of sin and death from Satan. That's took. That's it's period. Truth. That's just truth. That's fact. That's <laughs> never going to change. Yeah. And for me to let my anxiety speak louder than that is why I get so fired up because he paid that price. He paid the price. And how do we, how do we not let life speak louder? Yeah. And I think it's by meditating. I think it's by staying in and not listening to 
because I know Christians. I have Christians who will talk me out of my own beliefs, right? They'll be like, yeah, but, you know, we're growing into salvation. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they use these, we'll never be perfect till we get to heaven. And I think Pastor Gary said it best last week. Well, if I'm not, I can't remember how he said it, but uh, basically if I'm not perfect until I die, then Jesus isn't my Savior, death is. Mm, Yes. And so, like, yeah. Yeah, that hits different with you talking about all this and then saying, you know what I mean? Like making that point now. Yeah. That's what that means. Yeah. How you just explained. Yeah. Okay, let me go back. You were talking, you said you're you're pessimistic. Yeah, I think so. How does that tie into, because that's where you started that with. Yeah. So how does your pessimism, I don't know what I'm asking, but I want you to explain that more. Yeah. How that ties into that, what you were saying. And this is me like learning, right? I'm glad you said that because... What I just said was he didn't come to change us. He came to make us new. Mm -hmm. Me saying that I'm pessimistic is me holding on to old things. Okay. Right? Because... You're looking at life experience instead of the truth. Exactly. I see what you're saying. And so, and that's why I say naturally, which maybe that I should not say that. Well, your soul pulls you that way. Maybe I should say who I used to be Mm -hmm. is pessimistic, but who I am now is somebody that's full of hope. Right. Because that's what the truth says. And maybe instead of... Yeah, leaning on pessimism, I should lean into Jesus. Yes. And that's a very, I'm so glad you brought that up because in the moment, <clears throat> you see how easy it was. But it's in those moments when two Christians get together and, and you notice without, no, I think the Holy Spirit led this, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you brought that up and you notice, hey, hold on, you said you were pessimistic, but how does that work with what you're saying? Yeah. And I love that the Holy Spirit will correct in a moment. And it's easy, right? Yeah. Like, how easy is this? He uses our curiosity. Yeah. And from my standpoint, when people typically get corrected, you know, you hear it all the time, man, oh, the Lord really spanked me the other day. <laughs> he stepped on my toes. Yeah. Uh, love comes with, what, chastisement or something like that? Yeah, something like that. And so they want to portray God as this God that, like, beats you into submission. And But just then the Holy Spirit corrected me. And it was so smooth and so easy and so kind. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, for sure. That's cool. It is cool. I'm not quite sure why that happened, but I love it. I love it too. I love moments like that. Yeah. How do you feel about worship? (laughs) (laughs) I love worship. Hope. My hope is, and I think we can take just a second to pray. Yeah. Um, Because I feel something burning in my heart. Um. For a lifestyle of worship. And I'm going to preface this and say, I am a child of God. I am not an adult of God. Yeah. I'm a child of God that is learning from our Father how to live this life that He told me to live. With that same, being said, that's also not an excuse for me to stay where I'm at. Mm-hmm. And I say, I say that to say that I'm learning how to live a lifestyle of worship because I have the moments at work, right? Where it's like, I'm bombarded. I've got work going on and I've got family life going on and I've got friendships going on and I've got all this stuff begging for my attention. And there are times where I'm not living in the worshipful moment. That doesn't mean that I'm backslidden and sinning. That just means that I'm living like what a normal person would look like. Right. Yeah. 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 Um, so I definitely want to make that known. Like, I'm leaning into this as well. I'm leaning into the Holy Spirit to to hopefully be a pioneer of what a new worship lifestyle looks like for, that He intended us to be in. And so I'm going to pray, and if you want to, jump in there. But Yeah, I was going to say, before you pray, um, are you going to – well, my spirit is the opposite. Mm-hmm. My uh, way, My soul works, not necessarily my spirit. My soul, it pulls me – Everything's okay. Yeah. Everything's fine. Yeah. I have much more of an optimistic spirit, which is a whole different ballgame. So I was going to say, I can pray for the more optimistic spirit if you want yeah. to pray the other direction. Yeah. I think, yeah. I'm glad you said that because it's really important that I say, in my weakness, he's strong. Mm-hmm. You know, in my pessimism, he's optimistic. Yeah. And that's what I lean into, you know. So, yeah. Yeah. Let's go for it. Go ahead. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, for these people listening. For the person who hears our voice right now, we thank you for that person. We thank you that you brought them here to us to listen, Lord. 
I thank you for this opportunity we have to speak and to pray over everybody. I thank you for all that as much as I can. Lord, just thank you for everything you do. And I want to pray specifically for the optimist at heart because it's a little different. It's almost sometimes it's a little harder to look inward. It's harder to know where you need to think and how you need to think and how you need to lean because a lot of times you're like, well, it, everything's okay. It must be it must be okay. It must be fine. But I want to pray for that person including myself. The way I lean into you is to have to make myself do it. I have to make myself uncomfortable. I have to pull myself out of the easy spots and make it hard. Think a little more to push a little harder into the direction of leaning towards Jesus and to actually know what love is because love is pure and yeah. nothing perfect can come except through love. Yeah. And so I just want to pray that and pray that out that becomes easy to make it hard, as weird as that sounds. That's what it takes sometimes. So, Lord, I pray that right now. And I, I know that'll happen. Now, for me, the person listening, Lord, you make it easy to make it hard. Sounds weird, but that's where I'm going. You make it easy to make it hard. So, Lord, I pray that right now. Yeah, Jesus, I just thank you for um, for open hearts, God. I thank you that we can heed your voice and listen to you in the moments when everything else is begging for our attention. Holy Spirit, I just pray right now that anybody that's watching, that heart is burning to press press into a lifestyle of worship. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would give them eyes to see and ears to hear, that we would only do what you tell us to do, and we would only say what you tell us to say. Holy Spirit, I thank you that you're so kind and so gentle with us. And I thank you that you can be our strength and our weakness. And I thank you that uh, we don't press into the cultures mm -hmm. that are around us, even if it's a, a culture built through Christian values. Jesus, if it isn't your will, I pray that we can press into it and we can be graceful to show a different way, that you can lead through us and show us what true worship and spirit and truth is like, Jesus. Thank you so much. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Okay. Let's get into spiritual warfare. Yeah, I think we started like... We did. Yeah, absolutely. A lot of what you said, I think, has to do... It pulls that direction. It totally does. And I think that was a great foundation, how the Holy Spirit set worship and rendering Satan powerless yeah. and paying the price that he paid and going... That was a great foundation for where we're getting ready yeah, to go. Yeah, for sure. So, spiritual warfare. Mm -hmm. As... a uh, I think spiritual warfare is easy to box, box in. Not necessarily easy to, but it's commonly boxed in to something easy. Yeah. If that makes sense. Yep. So if you would just like you had me do first for worship, explain the way you think about spiritual worship or warfare. What is it? So what I think, I think it's, I tread lightly because I'm not an expert. Mm -hmm. So, I'm, and I don't experience certain things that other people do. So I think what spiritual warfare is simply is when we magnify dark spirits more than we magnify Christ. And I tread lightly in saying that because magnify, right? Like mm -hmm. people are immediately going to get offended when I say magnify. Right. Because that's not what it looks like when you're struggling with depression. You're not trying to magnify. Yeah. I've walked through depression. And I know how hard it is to be in that frame of mind, but I think depression is a form of spiritual warfare because these thoughts and which is where spiritual warfare happens is in the mind. Right. Like there is a spiritual realm. Don't get me wrong. There is. Jesus has conquered that realm. And I have prayed for people with possession. I've, I've seen people get free of demon possession. And it doesn't have to be the the um, cinematic thing that we make it. Mm. You think about Jesus when he stepped foot on the island of, I can't remember what it was, but the, the man was bound by many spirits. And immediately he comes to Jesus free, right? And then you think about um, 
the man who was bound by the other spirits, and Jesus sent those spirits into the pigs, and they jumped off the cliff. You don't see in Scripture Jesus fighting with demons. You just don't. Right? I mean, unless I'm wrong. If I'm wrong, I want to know. I want to see the Scripture where Jesus toiled and fought. That doesn't happen except for one time, and there's no real description of what the war was, and I'm talking about the Saturday between Friday and Sunday. Yeah. I've got my personal opinion on what happened there. I think we sing these songs that uh, you have no rival, yeah. you have no equal. Where those verses come from? They come from a revelation of Satan isn't even comparable to Jesus. Yeah, like there's no you can't say Satan was Goliath and Jesus is David. That's not what that is. Those no. are two humans. Um, anytime Jesus and Satan have a conflict, it's light and darkness, which is what I love how we started the night before <laughs> the cameras were turned on. We were talking about light and darkness. If you go into a dark room and you flip the light on, there is no more darkness in the room, period. The light is penetrating all things in that room. Darkness is the absence of light. Yes. It's not something that opposes light. Yes. Jesus is the absence of death. Right. Right. Right? Yeah. And so spiritual warfare to me is magnifying something that's defeated over Jesus who's defeated that thing. Now, I know, life experience, we've talked about this yes. multiple times. Like, yeah, but what about the people who are actually demon-possessed? What about addiction? What about all these things? And for that, I say, I don't know. And I'm not scared to say, I don't know. If you're dealing with those things, and you're hearing me, and your mind is getting offended, I hope... And I pray right now that the Holy Spirit is burning on your heart because that's that's his heart for you. He didn't come that you would be tormented. And yeah. it's as simple as saying, be free right now in Jesus' name. And then you walking into that freedom. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Now, I know things get a little different when we start talking about mental illness. Yeah. And of that, I have to say, I don't know. I, I don't know. I do know what the truth says. Right. Is that naive of me to say I don't know? Is that... Um, no, I think it's truthful. Is it heartless to say I don't know? I no. don't know. <laughs> I hope more than anything, people that get around me, and because this is my opinion, goodness, <laughs> this is my opinion, but I hope people can feel my heart. They can feel the Holy Spirit speaking these verses that are so true. Yeah, absolutely. So with that being said, I'm sure... Well, okay, let's talk about body, soul, spirit. Yeah. So I, I think that's the biggest, the differentiation, I probably said that wrong, but the difference between body, soul, and spirit for me has been the biggest change in my life. It's gotten me closer to God than anything else I've ever studied, focused on, been taught, anything mm -hmm. like that. The fact that you have a body, you have a soul, which is your emotions, and you have a spirit, which is what's going to heaven. Yeah. That's what was saved by God. Yep. So spiritual warfare, to be quite honest, is a pretty new topic for me. It's something that I haven't – I just never – like I said, growing up in a Baptist church, you're not taught about spiritual warfare. You're taught about how to love and be more like Jesus, that kind of thing. But spiritual warfare isn't the wording used. So where do you feel like that fits in? Because spiritual warfare, is that something that is in your soul to you when you I think mean, about it? It can be. I think, um, yeah, I mean, so body, soul, spirit, I love it. Um, but we see miraculous things happen to bodies. Mm -hmm. So I can't ignore that. I can't ignore that Jesus' sacrifice directly affects a body. He's directly affected my body before. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Everybody. Me too. He's worked miracles in my body. He's worked miracles in my soul, and he's worked miracles in my spirit. And so where does that fit in? I, I have to continually, and this is a discipline taught by the Holy Spirit, is to continually point every question back to him. Not back to, what about X, Y, Z, or what about... Um, this person that did this, I don't know. That person's not here. Now, if you are here and you're watching this and you're dealing with something, I feel like if you didn't hear it earlier, I said, be free right now in Jesus' name. 
I feel like those uttered words are enough. Absolutely. I have the faith and I have belief that Jesus can set you free from whatever is tormenting you right now in Jesus' name. Now, we may need to get small and realize I'm not. Before I say that, (laughs) sometimes I think spiritual warfare is us yielding this sword in Jesus' name to slay a spirit and do this this thing in the spirit realm. And I, I, I almost think that most of it is is it's uh, cinematic because, and I, I said this just a second ago, we don't see Jesus doing that, you know? Yeah. And so we take verses like, uh, yeah, but what about the, uh, the armor? Well, the armor, I don't know if you've ever heard this, but <laughs> in, uh, where is it here? Yeah, Ephesians six seventeen. take the helmet of salvation. Mm-hmm. All that means is you're thinking through salvation. You have salvation constantly on your mind. It's constantly there, which is what I said earlier. It's a discipline to point everything back to Jesus, back to him, back to him, back to him. That's the helmet of salvation. 17, there it is. And the sword of the Spirit, and this is where I think some some of spiritual warfare comes to life is through this verse, because people may not know what that means right there. If you translate the word sword back, guess what that word actually is? Word. Dagger. It's a dagger. This is not a sword that they used to fight. This is a dagger. And Roman soldiers back in that day, you know what they used daggers for? Assassinations. If a arrow snuck past your armor and pierced your flesh, you would use that dagger. If we read this again, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, you would, they would use the Word of God to minister to themselves mm. to get that fiery dart out. So now when you know that, and you know that you're not walking around like some soldier with this huge sword, but you're walking around as a child of God who has salvation on their mind and who uses the Word of God to not, like, slay things, but to minister to myself. Hmm. In case, just in case, a fiery dart makes it through the armor, yeah. which breastplate of righteousness, righteousness, what's that mean? Well, that just simply means that I keep righteousness covering me at all times, so offense can't can't pierce righteousness, right? Yeah. Like so when you look at that verse in a different sense and then you keep in mind that Jesus rendered Satan powerless, what do you have to fight and what do you have to fight with? Except for what Paul says, fight the good fight of faith. Stay in faith to know that he did it. Jesus accomplished this fight that I'm trying to fight is done. <laughs> Jesus said it himself, it's finished. Again, I understand life circumstance, like I understand people that deal with depression, anxiety, uh, mental illness. I don't, I, don't, I don't know why, right? And mm-hmm. everybody wants the answer why. I don't know. Yeah. Well, something we do know is something I enjoyed when researching this <clears throat> is that we know Satan wants to keep you fearful. So fear is a very powerful tool used against us. Mm -hmm. Fear is in our minds a lot, and that's what our soul constantly, we have to battle, is fear. And um, something that's cool is when you look at Jesus, because obviously the best way to battle these things is when you talk about spiritual warfare, whatever, any any kind of battle we're talking about, you look at Jesus, like you did when you're talking about how he never battled with Satan. Yeah. He just did. Yeah. He's the power. But... Jesus didn't worry. Jesus had the fear. I mean, he was a human. He had those fears coming into him. But what kept him from that? And this is what we work into, work towards is the perfect intimate relationship with the Father. Yeah. He had a perfect intimate relationship with the Father. And that's where we get the, what we've all heard and I know there's a verse I'm not sure what it is but the perfect fear. Perfect love with the Father casts out all fear. And I just l- loved reading that um, and realizing, oh, wait, that's what we're working towards, a perfect love with the Father, a perfect relationship, a perfect intimacy. I think that goes back to worship. That's what we're doing with worship. That's what I'm saying, man. It was foundational yeah. for us to set there. Yeah. We're digging into that relationship. And as you're saying that, I'm thinking about the person who is dealing with mental illness. Yeah. Because it's heavy on my heart. 
But I say I don't know. That doesn't mean I don't care. Right. I don't know means I'm not I'm not haughty enough to try to throw biblical knowledge at you and say, but I do think Jesus' goal for that person is exactly what you're saying. Perfect love. Yeah. So instead of focusing on the mental illness or focusing on the thing and I, man, I tread so lightly because I want to be tender and I want to be easy. His burden is easy and his yoke is light, right? right? So it's not like, but discipleship. Because you say, how did Jesus stay there? How did he stay in perfect love, cast out fear? How many times do we see in the word where he went away to <laughs> be with his father? He would just have to drop everything and go. Let me tell you a story. Okay, I'm going to tell you a story about this crazy huge miracle feeding 5,000. Why does it matter that he went away? Why is that verse in there? Because in my opinion, it's the sustainer of how those things happen in getting away with the Father in one-on-one time, yep. you know? Like surrounding yourself with worship and surrounding your and worship in, in the arts is what I'm talking about, surrounding yourself with music that does nothing but glorifies God until these things begin to break. Now, I do believe be free in Jesus' name is enough. I do believe that. But I also believe there is a there's an art and a uh, a reverence to setting and preparing a place for Jesus just to be all the time. I know he's here all the time. Um, but I'm talking about the people that are struggling with a thing that feel like maybe they're in a spiritual warfare. I can I remember one time. My daughter was two, two or three. And I do have a peaceful house. Um, my wife and I protect peace. We have very open and vulnerable conversations to protect peace. Yeah. What's that mean? Well, that might be an, another topic about relationships. But Satan wants to dis- disturb your peace. Absolutely. Jesus is rendered him powerless. So it's tough for him to do that unless you give him power to do that. And how do you do that? Is by hiding stuff and keeping things secret from your spouse or from your relationship to disturb the peace. Yeah. But if you're vulnerable and you're open and you're allowing, you're able to talk and keep the peace, Satan has no way to get in because you're open, you're vulnerable, and you're allowing peace to just maintain in your house. Yeah. That's all important for what I'm about to say about my daughter in spiritual warfare. <laughs> she would wake up, I think she was two, and she was sleeping with us. Um, she would wake up and she'd say, Dad, what's the lady in the red dress doing? I'm like, I don't I have no idea what you're talking about. There is no lady in no red dress. Hmm. After night, she would wake up, Dad, the lady in the red dress is here. And I'm like, what are you? Like, And I felt like the Holy Spirit was beginning to tell me, like, hey, it's time to cast this thing out of your house. And so um, actually something happened, and I don't remember what now, but I was at work. Jamie called me. She said, hey, this happened. I can't remember what happened, but an event happened. And I'm like, okay, I've had enough of this lady in the red dress, whatever it was. I don't, I never saw anything. Um, Oh, sorry. Jamie actually had a dream about the lady in the red dress Mm -hmm. and like coincided with what my daughter was seeing. And it like, so she called me, she's like, Hey, you've got to come home. So I left, went home and just said in Jesus name, any spirit that doesn't belong to Jesus must leave this house right now. From that point on, it was good. it was done. It's easy. It's as easy as that. Now, obviously, my daughter she was two. So you say, why didn't you do it the first night? Well, she's two. I have no idea what she's talking right. about. You know. So, anyways, I don't know why I told that story. Oh, it's because neat. of how easy it is. Yeah. Like I've watched people pray over somebody that was demon possessed for in Jesus' name. Get out. Period. Yeah. Be free in Jesus' name. You look at what Jesus did. I know his disciples asked one time, why, why didn't this one come out when we prayed that it would? Well, he had an answer. He said, well, this one only comes out by prayer and fasting, which goes back to what he would do is get away with his father. Jesus would get away with the father. And I believe in that time he's praying and he's fasting. Right. And so like, that's not hard. When you are communing with the father, all of this stuff you're seated in heavenly places. Like he's living inside of you. It's not you that's doing the things. It's him that's doing it through you, you know? Yeah. That was a mouthful. It's good. Yeah. It's good. Yeah. My heart just burns, man. It burns that people would press into what he did. Yeah. And it affects your body, 
your mind and your spirit, body, soul, spirit. Right. It does. It affects all of it. At least I believe that. Yeah. I really do. Um, see too many stories of it. Especially here at the Revolution. Yes. How many times have we seen people healed here? A lot. You know? I mean, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. What do you think? I don't know. I don't know. I'm kind of soaking it all in. I guess if this is new to you. Yeah. Yeah. Why wouldn't you be soaking it in? And I've a lot. um, I mean, what else can you say other than Jesus? It's the simplicity of the gospel. Yeah. And that's what we can't get away from. Right. We cannot afford to stray from the simplicity of the gospel in every area of our life. How do I become a better teacher? Simplicity of the gospel. Yeah. How do I become a better dad? Simplicity of the gospel. Point back to Jesus. How do I become a better husband? Simplicity of the gospel. It's yeah. always the answer. It's the answer for everything. Yeah. How do I become a better worshiper? How do I better live a life of worship? What is it? Check uh, somewhere in Ephesians. He says that uh, Paul's praying that God would give us um, a spirit of wisdom and understanding what the simplicity of the gospel mm. you know what i mean yeah and in the simplicity of the gospel is the deep stuff yeah that's crazy <laughs> yeah